This year marks the 66th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic ties between China and Syria. After so many years, what is the status of relations between the two countries? What is the situation now after 11 years of the Syrian crisis? And in light of Joe Biden's recent summit for democracy held in the U.S., is there such a thing as a one-size-fits-all model for democracy for any country in the world? With these questions in mind, earlier I spoke with His Excellency Imad Mustafa, ambassador of the Syrian Arab Republic to China, to gain his insights. Ambassador, thank you for joining us to discuss these topics. Well, China recently issued a white paper uh, titled "China: Democracy That Works." It details China's whole process, people's democracy, and the leadership of the Communist Party of China. So, what's your take on China's whole process, people's democracy? Uh, I believe this paper is uh, very rich with important ideas and concepts. Throughout my whole life as an observer of politics on the international scene and of history, political history, I have learned that、uh, there is no such thing as an ideal situation of a democracy anywhere in the world at any time. But countries evolve and continues to evolve into more, ever more democratic systems with time. This is a process. It is not a switch on of a binary switch. So there is no such a thing as a, a, an on off one zero democratic and democratic system. It is a process. It is a, an evolution that stems that comes out from the reality on the ground, from the social factors prevailing on the ground in each context, in each society. And it's an ideal, an, an attainable ideal that we, that all societies strive to reach at one point through the evolution and development of their societies and their political systems. The greatest thing about China's white paper on democracy is this deep understanding of this uh, 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 very important issue. Well, you know, if you compare the Chinese-style democracy with that of the Western model of democracy, how are they different?、Uh, I would say the major difference, and this is a fundamental difference, is that、uh, the Chinese、uh, leadership understands democracy as a governance system that comes from the people and works for for the people. They come from the people and they work for the people, and the people is the focus of their democratic system.、Uh, as an example, if you compare it to the parliamentary Western-style、uh, democracy as practiced in the United States, you would notice that the United States whole political system was designed for the one person, the most powerful, most rich one per percent. It is designed for it. And it is ruled by it. All those who are in the ruling administration come from the one percent, and everything they do, they do for the benefit of the one percent. But yet, they say, "Look, we go and we ask the people, and the people choose us." The the hidden agenda is that everything is so tailored that the people have only the right to choose either one that belongs to the one percent. Or another one that belongs to the one person, and in both cases, the objectives of governance, whether this one's win or that one win, would be for the benefit of the one person. So here are the two major differences between the Chinese adopted style of democracy, which is focused on the people's needs, the development of the people and of the society, as compared to a system that addresses the need of the most powerful and the most rich one. Mm -hmm. uh, what、well, you mentioned about the democracy being a process, I wonder is there a one-size-fits-all model for all, you know, for democracy, or if not, in the whole kind of country, develop a model of democracy that better suits itself? Well, first, absolutely, absolutely, any、uh, political scientist, intellectual, scholar, or academic would know that there is no one size that fits. Uh, one, uh, all models. First, second, not even one single model has one size of democracy that fits it forever. I mean, if you look at the Western societies,、hmm? 
in a very objective way, let's not now start to criticize, uh, just object. You will see that their so-called democratic system in the past 200 years has kept on evolving and it's evolving nonstop. And if you choose any temporal snapshot, any snapshot in time, you would see that at this given moment, this and that so-called Western-style democratic system is far more democratic than this or that. You have, as an example, a system that is called past the poll. As an example, in the United Kingdom, in Britain, if 49% uh, of the British people would vote for the Labour Party and 51% would vote for the Conservative Party, in the British Parliament, you will not end up with a 51% of uh, representatives representing the Conservative Party, you might end up actually with 100% because this system is called past the poll. This system does not exist as an example in another European country like Italy, which is proportional representation, but you end up with very weak government, governments that are incapable of delivering anything and that cannot even last for more than 18 months, which is the average life span of any Italian government since the end of World War II. So each democratic system has advantages and has shortcomings and sometimes major disadvantages. And all countries keep on reviewing their democratic systems and attempt, strive to improve them. So absolutely, there is no one system that fits all countries and all societies. And there is no one system that is always good for a single country forever. This does not exist. Well, that's right. Well, not a long ago, you know, a European uh, think tank uh, added the U.S. to this uh, group of uh, countries with a backsliding democracy. What do you make of that? Look, uh, let me say this to you, and believe me, if m many political scientists from the United States itself, mm, who are prominent academics in the United States right now living and who are teaching at major U.S. universities, have written tons and tons of studies, articles, and, uh, and analysis of the democratic system of the United States, pointing out that this is a very flawed democracy. First, let me tell you this, and this is a fact, please, it is a fact, it's not an opinion. Only 23% of the U.S. people, of the United States population, can decide the outcome of the U.S. presidential elections because of the so-called electoral college. The so-called electoral college gives states that only have 23% of the population, 51% of the electoral college votes, which means a small state like, uh, uh, let me say, Wyoming will have more influence than a large state like California and the United States. I don't want to go into the complexity of the U.S. electoral system, but let me say this. First, only, only 23% of the population can decide the outcome of the elections, which means that more than 75%, 77% of the people would choose someone but their uh, choice will go to the trash bin because the 23% have chosen the one they want to rule all of America. Second, the Senate system in the United States, the Senate, means that only senators who belong to very powerful, ri rich, the very powerful and rich establishment can occupy two seats of a very small state, like a state of um, that can have only half a million people living in it and they will have equal power to the two senators chosen for a state like california with 55 million people and they have the same equal uh, rights to vote in the u.s senate which means you don't have real representation of the people on equal level it is all biased towards how the deep establishment in the united states serves itself Third, the United States Constitution, which was written by the so-called founding fathers of the United States, is uh, 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 extremely, extremely legendary difficult to amend or modify anything. So this is how it was done, and this is how it will be for a very, very long time to come. While societies evolve, while uh, people inside the United States criticize their election system, their constitution, nothing can be done. Very rigid system, in a sense.
Uh, and you mentioned about you know the weaponizing of democracy. You know, as long as the country was seen as a non-democracy, and then there could be pressure or attack. Uh, and related to that, we have been seeing uh, you know attacks, you know accusations against the China's Xinjiang. You know, the the forced labor, all the courting issue. You know, what is the purpose? Some of the charges are basically laughable and out of touch with the reality. Why are they doing that? Look, sometimes you have to feel pity for the United States. I mean, I mean it in a sarcastic way, not in a serious way. Please, if you go back to the history of the United States, the United States was established by the so-called founding fathers, based on an unprecedented historic genocide against the native people. Uh, uh, they came to a land that they do not own, and they killed hundreds of thousands of native people, and they stole their lands. Second, once they established themselves, they, they went to Africa and forcibly enslaved hundreds of thousands of free, uh, dignified human beings, brought them in chains to the United States to work as, as slaves there in the cotton plantations and in other uh, oil and gold mine, uh, mines and fields so that they can enrich themselves based on the toil of those uh, uh, slaves. Third, and this is so important, that the United States has established itself and has sustained itself throughout its history without a single interruption by launching one single war against one country, followed by another war against another country, one conflict. Uh, it, it, this is how it thrives. This is how the military, industrial, oligarchs of the United States rule the United States. I can go into the history of the United States in more detail, but I don't think we have the time now to discuss this. President Eisenhower, in his farewell speech to the nation, warned his nation against that what is happening in America is that the military industrial complex that is actually ruling the United States keeps on pushing the United States from one conflict to another so that they can sustain this level of tension so that the United States will use the taxpayer, taxpaying money to buy weapons, very advanced weapons, and to launch wars everywhere in the world instead of taking care of the debilitated infrastructure in the United States, the poverty that you can see across the United States, the non-existence of a, a national health system, and hundreds and hundreds of other uh, very profound, very serious social problems in the United States, the richest country on earth that spends most of its money launching wars against the others. Mm -hmm. So is Xinjiang somehow part of that uh, you know, scheme? If, well, Xinjiang is is uh, uh, one block in this political domino of the United States. First, the United States cannot tolerate, cannot tolerate any country that dares to say to it, I want, e based on equal, equal interest and equal uh, benefit, I want a respectful, dignified uh, uh, relation with me. The United States only accept a relation in which is, it plays, in which it plays the hegemon role. First, second, China, China, let me be very clear about this, is a very serious, profound problem for the United States, not only for economic reasons. There is another problem, a political problem. For ages, the United States was claiming that the only political system that works in the world and that is successful is a, a political system based on that which is uh, uh, used and followed in the United States. And here come, comes China and adopts another political system based on socialism with Chinese characteristics for the new era. And this completely different political system is considered by all spectators and observers as one of the most successful political systems in the world and maybe in history, because what China has achieved in the past 70 years has been unparalleled in the history of mankind. And suddenly, suddenly, the United States is in a very embarrassing position, a very embarrassing situation. Here comes an alternative political model that says, who said, who said that you have monopoly on truth and wisdom? Who said that you know how to be a successful country? Here we are, a very successful country with a completely, totally different political system. And other countries now have other choices 
they don't have only one system, one model to follow. They can choose between the model, that, or maybe they can adapt from other models. China, by being success, successful, has undermined the whole political philosophy of the United States. This is so profound and so important. But you add to this the spectacular economic success of China, the spectacular prestige that China is gaining across the world, and you can imagine how frustrated and how angry the United States is with the, conce with the concept of a successful China. Put this in context with the history of warmongering of the United States, and you will see that eventually the United States is obliged, this is why I have some pity to, with, towards the United States, is obliged by its genes to create a conflict with China. So they will have to find uh, pretexts, reasons. So they will keep on creating, believe me, believe me, it will not stop at Taiwan, it will not stop at Hong Kong, it will not stop at Xinjiang. They will keep on creating one story after another. They have done this to my country. They have done this to Iraq. They have done this to Cuba. They have done this time and again across the world. And now they are targeting you. Luckily, fortunately, China is a powerful, solid, strong, successful country. And the United States will not be able to uh, arm twist China into submission and into uh, following the dictates from Washington, D.C. Uh, you mentioned the success uh, of China over the past decades. Uh, of course, that has a lot to do with, uh, uh, you know, the CPC being uh, the party uh, running the country. How do you view uh, the world's largest governing party and its achievement over the past years? I, I personally believe, I personally believe that China has achieved a miracle. I mean, look, the, it, the United States of America today is a very rich, advanced country, but it took it 250 years to attain this level. China, under the leadership of the Polit uh, Communist Party, has achieved this in a, in, in a considerably shorter time. But it's not only the output, I mean, the measure of the GDP or the industrial manufacturing output or the wealth of the nation, you have to go from the macroscopic view to the microscopic view. Today, if you go to any major, any major United States city, Washington, D.C., New York, uh, Chicago, Los Angeles, just go and walk downtown, they call it. I mean, the center of the city. And you will see unbelievable misery, homeless people, beggars, uh, whole areas where only drug lords rule and where crime is prevalent. Of course, the rich people live in separated suburbs. And the United States government, the richest country in the world, doesn't care at all, at all, for the fate of the poor people there and for uh, the poverty levels there. They, it's not their business. They only care about how to give more and more tax exemptions to the powerful and the rich so that they can become richer and richer. Come to the China, forget all the great successes in the output. I mean, and if you look from the external, look at the input, look at how China has worked so hard in every city, every province, every village to improve the lot of the ordinary citizen in China. I'm very proud to say that today I can go to any city in China, any city, Hefei, uh, Jingdezhen, wherever I go, I feel safe walking in any street. There are no crime levels. It is safe. There are no beggars, no homeless people, uh, no abject poverty, the sort that you can see in other uh, major democracies of very rich nations. Mm -hmm. This is the greatest achievement of China, that from the macro level, it has achieved spectacular results, but on the micro level, it has taken care of every single Chinese citizen. This is, as far as I am concerned, the true democracy. Yes, um, from China to uh, China's policy toward other countries, you know, uh, one of them is um, BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, how do you see its uh, development over the past years and how do you see, you know, BRI in particular, the relationship with your country? Uh, I see B, the Belt and Road Initiative in, in very simple terms. China is becoming ever uh, uh, affluent and ever 
advanced. And China believes that this, this good that is happening in it uh, cannot live, cannot exist in isolation of the rest of the world. It believes that if the neighbors of China and even if the further countries far away from China are also becoming richer and more advanced, this will be uh, 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 beneficial for both parties. Uh, so China believes that if it helps the others, this will also reflect on China positive. It will help them. China will help the other countries to develop. Uh, if, if the rest of the world is rich, they will buy more and more from China. So when China is helping the others to become more and more advanced, it's also helping its own people. This is a comprehensive philosophy. It, and it's, it, it is a philosophy based on understanding that humanity, human community must have a shared future. And this philosophy is, is the underpinning of the Belt and Road Initiative. In the Belt and Road Initiative, China is helping other nations, like my own country, to evolve and develop. And China believes that when Syria becomes more and more rich and developed, Syria will do more and more business with China. And then China will also benefit. And when China benefits, it will help more and more Syria. It's, it's an, 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 a mutually beneficial equation for both parties that is really a reflection of the wisdom of the wisdom of the leadership in China, or you must say of the core leader, President Xi Jinping, but also it reflects the political ethics of socialism. And this is the difference, the, the core difference between socialism and capitalism. In capitalism, if you are rich, do whatever you can do to become richer. If he is poor, well, he is poor. What can we do for him? <laughs> right. That's the major difference. The win-win the relationship. Uh, uh, speak of that, uh, uh, this year, as we said, marks the 66th anniversary of this uh, diplomatic relationship between China and Syria. Uh, how do you describe the current uh, status between the two countries? I can say that the relations are far beyond warm. They are very, very solid, strong relations. China has stood with Syria in its very difficult moment in history. And China has proved that a friend in need is a friend indeed. And we in Syria, we will never, never forget that in our most difficult moment, China stood with us. We are ever grateful. And we are keen on advancing and furthering the relations, bilateral relations between Syria and China in a continuous way. We want them to attain unprecedentedly high levels. Uh, Ambassador, how is the situation now in Syria? Actually, uh, uh, let me start with the situation in Syria. Fortunately, today, the majority of the Syrian cities and majority of Syrian population are living in, in peace and order. Uh, the economic cycle has resumed. Life is normal for the Syrian people at, across almost all the Syrian cities. And we are mostly focused now on rebuilding our economy uh, because the economy was uh, hit very hard by the terrorist groups that were supported financially, politically, diplomatically, and militarily by the United States of America and her Western allies. But also because these, uh, because following the, the, the cessation of the hostilities, the United States has imposed very harsh sanctions on the Syrian people, targeting the weakest strata of the social society in Syria, of the Syrian society. So the poorest people in Syria, the weakest, are targeted now by the most powerful and rich country in the world, the United States of America. This talks to you a lot about the human uh, values and the democracy of the United States. Um, um, uh, today also, I need to say this to everybody, the United States is occupying the oil fields in Syria. US military are inside Syria today around our oil fields and every couple of weeks they smuggle, uh, but under the light I mean, uh, ton tens and tens of big oil tanks from Syria to outside Syria, stolen oil from a poor country like Syria by the richest country in the world. And yet they lecture the rest of the world about human values and democracy and world order. 
This is daylight piracy and robbery practiced today by the United States of America in Syria. Our oil fields and gas fields today are occupied by the United States of America, and this is rarely mentioned across the world. Right. Uh, I also want you to comment. You know what's uh, upcoming? That's the Beijing 2022 Winter Olympics. Uh, um, you know what's your expectation, and you know how do view some countries? You know who said that they wouldn't send uh, government officials to attend the event. Uh, uh, first, let me say about the uh, second half of your question. I think it's political jealousy, and it's very cheap, low-level politicizing of the games. They just want to attack China, criticize China, do whatever to tarnish the image of China. But China, by merely being successful, is making their life so difficult. I mean, China is not doing anything bad to them, but they cannot accept the fact that this country. That does not follow our political model is so successful. Here is my my expectation. I think this coming Winter Olympics will be so successful, both on the organizational level and from the mere、uh, pure sportive、uh, level, and it will only drive them more angry. Believe me, the more successful you are, the more angry they will become, the more sinister, and they will come up with more and more stories to try to tarnish the image of China. But the only reaction from China towards this attempt by them should be that China would continue to become ever more advanced, ever more successful, and ever more powerful. This is not only good for China, by the way. You really please really understand this. All all small countries in the world are so happy for China's progress, because a unipolar world. Dominated by the United States of America, has caused us incredible suffering. Only when the United States will understand that it is not the only power in the world, but the sole player on the world scene, only then maybe, maybe the United States will tune down its aggressive,、uh, hostile policies towards the rest of the world. So every success achieved by China is. Looked upon by the rest of the countries in the world as a success for the world order, and this is why I'm so happy that China is doing what it is doing right now and moving forward in a continuous, non-stop way. Well, thank you, Ambassador. That's all the time we have for this edition of Dialogue. I'm Xu Qingduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.